And the, the idea now was just to open up the room to discussions, questions to the speakers on stuff they talked about, or just dialogue about um, open access, collaboration, the themes that came up. Um, and I don't want to do too much driving. So do we have questions for any of the speakers from the themes that came up? Yep. I have a question for Adam. And and I, I'll be passing out the microphone just because we are uh, So I have a question about the predatory conferences. I mean, I think we all must get emails four or five a week from Judy or Crystal or how they haven't responded to their last email. And do people actually go to those conferences and what happens when you get there? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I should actually know the answer to what happens, not, not firsthand, I will maybe know, um, but, but secondhand, you know, by which I mean I read it on a blog somewhere. But, but there was a, a firsthand account of a guy who actually went, um, and he, when he got there, um, he realized that he was, um, there were like 15 um, conferences going on hosted by the same organizer in the same place. So, you know, they, they, they had this, this room and they had it you know, subdivided up in these little groups. And essentially what everyone did is they showed up and they were really, really concerned to get everyone who showed up to take a group photo to kind of prove that you were there, right? Um, and then everyone just pisses off and goes on vacation. The, the, whole, the whole point of it, as far as he under, could tell, was that it's a way to you know legitimately spend grant money on vacations, and they're always held in places like Orlando and you know things like that. So you know that that is my best understanding of why it is that something that's just so obviously like weird, you know, still is actually being used is that there have, there people have to be in on it somehow, and what that's what you see with predatory publishing too over in. Um, uh, in uh, in the Asian countries, there you get credits, you get sometimes cash incentives for publishing in an international journal, and that's why all of the predatory journals will name themselves International Journal of you know uh, insert name here. So I mean, this, there's definitely some complicit uh, stuff in there. We, we've discussed it with you, William. Um, We've actually done an analysis two years ago when uh, Buchanan's Sting on Open Access came out. Uh, we did an analysis on our readers. We have data that's just like Mendeley. Well, it's much smaller, but what people are reading and saving in, uh, from PubMed. Right? So we have users and they have libraries. And what we did is we took a look from that Sting um, so that uh, we, we need to update the analysis. We, our users we were young. They had 100,000 articles in their libraries at this point. Today we have over a million, so it would be nice to repeat it. I actually want William to do it with Mendeley. But what we did is we answered exactly that question. Does anybody read the scam journals, right? Is it really that much of a problem? And it turns out um, of the papers of the journals that rejected the scam paper, right? um, tons of articles in the libraries of our users from those journals, because people read those journals and they actually sent it out to peer review and realized the paper is crap. Uh, of all the journals that uh, accepted, right, we actually essentially had no articles from those journals in our users' databases. Right? So it was a very clear binary thing. The good journals, people read. The scam journals, they publish. They waste resources and money. But it's not like people are reading bad science uh, is my takeaway. And I'd love to do the analysis with Mendeley. It's still a problem, and we should still avoid it, of course. Yes, and, and by all means, we should continue paying um, you know, uh, Mr. Um, Beal's speaker fees to come and tell everyone what a big problem it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> other, other comments or questions on the predators? <laughs> it's not about predators. It can be uh, Thanks. This is a question for the, the first speaker, and I guess the person that maybe developed the software or runs the organization said this year as well. But, uh, um, yeah, so I was curious. I mean, it's you know, a great idea to have this sort of you know, open, collaborative 
uh, review and, but, and with incentives. Um, and I was curious um, how those incentives are divvied up. I mean, because you would think that volume is not a great incentive. You would want to sort of go for quality. How do you compensate people that really put time and thought into it and provide the most value to improve the work? Um, so that's one question, and sort of uh, related to that, so I was wondering if there's any thoughts about how this might, um, so it sounds like you were doing maybe sort of in the development of your, of your studies, getting feedback, but if, anyone, if you're trying to use this to um, interface with the sort of more traditional peer review um, practice, whereas now there are some companies where you, you can sort of pay for peer review uh, and then send those reviews to a journal, that if anyone's trying to sort of say, I'm going to put my $5,000 of grant money up there, secure my own reviews, respond to them, address them, and when I submit to a journal, um, provide sort of response to reviewers and say this has been through at least some sort of uh, peer review already. Josh? With regard to the first question, uh, the comments are peer assessed, so it's basically um, you kind of indicate the level of value you think that's adding, and that's based on those peer assessments that the uh, financial incentive is distributed. Um, with regard to your second question, that's not something I've thought about a lot. I haven't really thought that far ahead. Uh, we don't have any projects that have actually got to this stage of um, publishing a paper. Um, yeah, I don't think the first question is a big problem just because the other readers rate the comments at a perceived value. I don't think that would be a problem. I think there's algorithms that can look at that. And we can, I mean, right now it's uh, limited to people that have a re uh, email at a research institution. But uh, longer term, there's. Uh, I mean, they're recording, sorry. Yeah, longer term, I think there's. Um, going to be ways to prevent any kind of circle of, like, you know, giving each other money. <laughs> I just wanted to briefly, to the, um, to the pre-publication we're doing with Science Open an experiment to say, what if we offer um, scientists the possibility to find an endorser for their paper, somebody who will give them feedback on the paper, read it, and then, um, and then sign on the publication that I have read this paper, gave, given the author's feedback, and now think that this paper is of a quality to enter into the scientific literature. So you basically have somebody with their name saying, this is good. And we're, we're trying that out to also sort of speed up this peer review process and make it more a dialogue between scientists without publishers always in the middle. Um, so we're trying that out uh, as another experiment in peer review. Maybe something somebody else might want to also jump in on. I get three Uh, just, just to pick up on that point um, and and uh, and make an interesting little tie to, to Wikipedia. Um, when we were, uh, when I, when I was working for the Wikimedia Foundation, talking to professors, trying to do the early stages of designing a, a, a program to help connect Wikipedia with academia, one of the comments that we got from a, a professor I spoke with was that, and he was he was a journal reviewer. See, or no, he was a journal editor. So he was, he was uh, really concerned about the peer review process. And he was really frustrated because in the kind of time frame that you had in a graduate program, it was impossible for his students to experience peer review, to experience the kind of conversations that could take place over decades. You know, in when one person publishes an article, someone responds to it or incorporates it, and it goes back and forth a few times. And he was really excited because he felt that by engaging with Wikipedia, that potentially gave his students the opportunity to experience that kind of academic dialogue. So I have a question for Mackenzie um, at Davis. Is there any, are you guys trying at all to work with any existing like all metric companies like Impact Story or Allmetric to try and get more of that code and, and things like that into the overall picture of what your scholarship is? Yes. 
Sure, but the point I was trying to make is that um, the typical behavior of people is to cite a paper <clears throat> rather than, I mean, there's a big problem about getting people to pay attention to all metrics, and that's, that's something we're working on. But what I'm just trying to do here is think about how to get you to cite data or software directly rather than authoring a paper and paying to get it published or publishing it in a commercial journal, right? And so I love all metrics, but you try getting a tenure committee to use them, right? It's, we got a ways to go. Just uh, also a comment on citing software. Uh, Titus Brown recently had a discussion he's on... Also at yep, he's now he's, uh, And by the way, Jonathan Eisen called uh, Mackenzie the most successful poaching by uh, Davis. <laughs> Davis apparently is very good at poaching. Um, so, uh, but the comment was, uh, Titus Brown recently talked about the fact that journals, subscription journals, right, the high impact ones, will very often, because they want very small, short articles, well, very often the editors will ask you to remove citations to software just to make the paper shorter and to have fewer um, references. And it's insane, right? But that actually happens. Um, it's a huge issue. And you, should, and you should, you know, yell and pick up a fuss when that happens and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, this probably isn't a, uh, a good point to, to mention that. Uh, it's getting a lot easier to, to introduce those kinds of citations. Um, the, the way Mendeley always worked is that we have this tool and you can just you know press a button and the citation goes into your paper and you don't have to mess with it. So we're doing a similar thing for data. We're generating citations for data and you'll be able to insert those just like you've always done. So hopefully that will make you know the process a little bit easier. You're working with some data you want to share with people, you put it up, you know, wherever Mendeley data, wherever you want to, you know, your you know. Uh, institutional repository, wherever it's you know, it, the data needs to be, and um, uh, you can put software there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so you know you're going to, when you do that, not only do you get a um, citation metadata, so you can plug that citation into your paper and just cite it like you're doing anything else, you know, uh, but you also get um, another important thing: you get a DOI for that, right? Which means that it gets out into um, Crossref, it gets registered, you get permanent preservation, so long-term preservation of that stuff um, as an official work of scholarship. So you're just getting more of the kind of the infrastructure around these other scholarly objects too. Um, so, it's, so it's happening. I have no idea what the order was. Um, you're a speaker, so you, you already had some of the microphone. <laughs> Super good question. How do you link to software and data? How do you like because giving a DOI is great, but the DOI for what? Like, do you do you have like a, a do you link to a repository and an open access GitHub or still repository? I don't know. I'm just asking. Well, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, so if you upload, um, if you're using Mendeley data, for example, and you've been uploading data um, as you're working on it um, into your private data repository, then you you said, okay, this is ready. You know. Um, I'm, I'm ready to make this data set available. I've, I've you know, sent in my publication, or this, this thing's ready for release. Um, you flip the publication switch, and then your article gets, you know, it goes live on the web. It gets permanently backed up. It gets snapshotted, so that particular version is not frozen, you know. Um, and that's when you get that um, that link. So the link then resolves to that publication page uh, where you've published your data on Mendeley data, you can also have links to go to, you know, Zenodo or Dataverse or, you know, your, your IR, or wherever your data might be. Um, but um, it's nice to have it in a place that has a long-term preservation policy. And so, I mean, software is data, right? <laughs> you, can, you can treat, you know, the files, right? I don't think you should separate the two. I think if you're going to be storing um, data in a place, you need to store the software that you use to generate or process that data alongside it and as part of that same package. So I don't think there's a separation. And uh, sorry, can I just put in a plug really fast? So I'm from the library and we do have a two layer. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm the data management librarian at, um, here at UCSF, and we actually do have a tool called DataShare, which is basically an open data repository. So if you put, if you're looking for a place to share your data, um, you can put it in DataShare, and you'll get that DOI, so you can cite it. Um, so we're we're excited if anyone wants to use it. Uh, ask us any questions about it. All right, and then, and then uh, Daniel. Sorry, no over. Hi, my, uh, my question is for the librarians, and it's not directly related to your presentations, but um, it has to do with, in general, open access uh, publishing funds. And it seems like you have a classic problem where um, uh, the libra libraries can't repurpose subscription, fund subscription budgets for uh, APCs until the publishers switch over their journals to open access uh, um, journals, but then the, 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 the publishers don't, can't switch over the, the journals from subscriptions to open access until the librarian, to the library switch the subscriptions to APCs. So it's this classic problem, it's like who's going to go first, and so no one's really going, or it's happening very slowly, and I'm curious, it seems to me that um, one way of solving this problem is by you know large-scale collaboration, and I'm curious if there's any kinds of projects going on, or if if, if how you see how, how if you have any sort of thoughts on how to get around this um, kind of cat and mouse game or chicken and egg problem? You, um, actually, Alex will have something to say too. But we, you're absolutely right. We're in this situation today where we're paying three times for the same article because we still have to subscribe. We're archiving it green and we're supporting OA fees, often for the same journal that we subscribe to, right? Because so many of these hybrid journals are coming out. But um, I do think that there is a possibility that we could flip the system to a sustainable gold model in our lifetime. And we have a project um, that all the campuses are involved in called Pay It Forward, where we're looking to see what, what that would look like financially. Okay, so it's building some financial models to say at what price across different disciplines, could we flip it today and go 100%? So I think we're getting to the point where we have to start asking those questions because we can't keep paying for it three times. You know, I can do that for a little while, but it's going to start hurting. Well, it already hurts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, I, I want to ask that question and be rigorous about it, really, and, and see if we can figure out how to get out of this situation. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that that you know right now the, the the payment for article processing charges for open access, so you know gold open access, is being paid for from many different sources. You know compared to like the traditional model of subscriptions, where it's you know typically a library is paying has like one lump collections budget and pays for that. Right now, APCs are being paid mostly by individual researchers out of grant funding, um, and. Perhaps their departments are paying for it, but I think most, in most cases it's grant funding. And some individuals are paying out of pocket, believe it or not, because those APCs can be quite high. Um, we do have a fund, that, like in the case at UCSF, we do have an open access publishing fund. Um, right now it's being funded with, by funds from the Academic Senate, which is a faculty body. But it's, it's really just a, a drop in the bucket of the, art, the number of articles that it can fund compared to what gets published at UCSF. So this is definitely an issue. And, and we, we question whether the value of continuing that fund just because of that, because it's so few articles. I mean, UCSF authors and co-authors publish 6,000 articles per year. I mean, we're a very, very prolific institution as far as publishing. And the OA fund is going to publish maybe like 20 to 30 at UCSF articles per, per year. So it's a very small percentage of what's what's actually being published out there. I'm not a librarian, but I could add that uh, there are some examples of collaborations. Um, in high energy physics does one, I think it's called Scope 3. And um, any other examples of this kind of oh, thing going on? Yeah, 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 for books. Yeah. Um, so they're, there's a lot of different people trying a lot of different models to get around it. So uh, it's all on this theme. Yeah, it's all the same theme, which is essentially the you know how do we try and take some of the money back? The publishers are you know well aware they're they're double triple dipping. They're they're you know making a killing here. They recognize it. They're so excited. So and we've talked. You know 
we talked to the library committee faculty about at certain points just saying no and not getting into the subscription increases, but are we also, we have talked about for a while, but I don't know what we're doing of those 6,000 articles, how many of them are gold away? And are we going back to the publishers and saying we spent as an institution, regardless of the source, this amount of money, we want that discounted off of our licensing agreement? Yeah, they're trying to. So in the UK, where, you know, in this country, um, green is much more popular, but in the UK where gold has been around for a while, they're starting to do these um, offsetting negotiations where you say, okay, we published 1,000 open access articles, so we want a discount on our license. Um, and some publishers are going along with that, not Elsevier. But uh, well, some of the other- publicly say they are. Well, they're not, but, uh, <laughs> but some of the others are. So that, that might be a transitional model so that we don't go broke during the transition. But, um, but that's a pretty new thing, just in the past six months or so. But it is, it is a positive sign. So you've had a comment. Um, I, I'll, I'll get to you in a second, but there was a comment. It, it's still on this print. Did you have a comment on this? On this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Daniel, and then you, because there's no queue. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so so I'm I'm from UC Press, and uh, just just first one plug and then uh, an answer. So um, so we we, uh, we we try and do different things to to, to change the, the status quo. We we launch an open access journal, Collabra, where we uh, where we give credit, monetary value back to reviewers, and reviewers can actually keep that money or or pay it forward to their institutions. Um, but I think the, 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 the problems that, that we're running into is, is also, it's not really, I think, up to the publishers and the libraries to, to figure this one out, right? I mean, a lot of this has to do with, with tenure and promotion. And a lot of it has to do with the choices that researchers make when they decide to publish and where. That's, 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 the, that's the, the, the foundation that we need to change. And I think if we can change that, then, then publishers will follow. We will follow for sure, right? But we, we, it's, it's, it's not just us in the library that have to figure it out. So I just wanted to say a lot can be accomplished in open science by just saying no. Mm -hmm. And then actually you have to say no a lot. So some examples are the editor that wanted you to take out the citations. Or uh, now Spark made an addendum which you can attach your copyright transfer agreements to a journal basically says, no, we're going to retain non-exclusive rights and therefore we can share our own paper. Or another example um, would be collaborators just say, no, I'm not publishing in a subscription journal. And then finally, the biggest one, which I'm currently tackling as we speak, is universities want you to sign agreements uh, to get jobs which actually can prevent you from publishing your work openly because they have the ownership of the work and could potentially suppress it. Uh, so, I'm trying to say no to this, and I'll report back how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mackenzie. Hi, I'm Alexandra. <clears throat> um, I've been kind of listening and trying to figure out, from a higher level perspective, or just a left field perspective, what is the biggest blocker to open publication? And from what I've heard, um, not being in this field, it seems like underlying it all is a kind of deep human emotions of fear and shame, which a couple of people kind of touched on, which need maybe to be. Um, it seems like there's a the movement and the tool providers here could benefit from maybe reassuring people and there's an education piece probably that you know you'll still be loved and successful if you publish openly. Or better yet, maybe you'll be more loved and more successful, right? And um, I think the movement will have succeeded when it stops becoming a thing. And you don't have to be proud to be open access, it's just normal and mainstream. Can I um, just abuse my privilege as moderator in the last minute to close it on this exact theme of what I actually wanted to open it with? Which was, um, what I wanted to say at the introduction is that open access as the movement, it's about 20 years, right, of hard, work from a lot of people. And what it has accomplished in those 20 years is absolutely remarkable, right? We've gone from 0% of papers being open access back in 95, and probably even in 2002, right? Plus Biology launched in 2003. So we are, uh, somebody give me a better number, but I think we're at about 25, 30%, uh, not that high yet. But it's much higher than 
Right, so it's much higher, but the problem is, and this is what came up here, the problem is the progress has been remarkable. The problem is what hasn't happened is we're not 100% away. And what that means is the libraries are still paying all of the subscriptions that they were paying before, and now we're also paying for publication of open access, right? And it's we have to get to that 100%, um, which is hard to do, but I think there are a lot of the collaborative stuff, the peer review, opening up peer review, and the post-publication peer review, I think is a huge thing. We didn't have enough time to discuss that in detail, but I think that's one of the key things um, in moving away from assessing based on journals. And the last thing that I just um, it's not really part of the theme, but I think it's a, a new and important player in this. We didn't bring it up as preprints. And then, um, I wrote a blog post on this yesterday talking about, because there's a huge fear of going open access exclusively, committing to it, and will it hurt my career, right? Um, there are some people here like me from the Eisen lab who've made that commitment, but not everyone can do that, and not in all labs will it make no difference. But preprints are something that everybody can and should be doing. Um, and if we get to a point where 100% of everything we're publishing is also on the preprint server, like archive or bioarchive, libraries are going to have a pretty compelling case to go to the publisher and say, we're not going to pay for this anymore because there's a free version of everything available. So it's, it's a new thing that's really one or two years in biomedicine and physics, of course, it's the kind of publisher. That, the logic of that argument, right, is that if everything is available as a preprint, we can stop subscribing to the journals, in which case they'll all fail, right? Mm -hmm. So there won't be any journals to submit your articles to. The preprints don't, you know, they don't count academically. So how does that work at scale? <laughs> Please tell me. Uh, that works together with, with post-publication peer review. PubMed Commons, yeah. PubPeer. Um, so no more terms. Essentially, I, I think journals can curate afterwards, and we can use Science Open to create collections. Um, there will be a role for editors and journals to corral scientists to do the peer review, right? Because just because you put up a preprint, it doesn't mean that scientists are not flocking to writing reviews for you. So there'll still be a role for publishers, but um, it, it's a very soft but Trojan horse way um, where you put out preprints, but eventually when enough people are doing it, um, it will undermine the journal as it exists today. I do have to point out, though, that um, the preprint doesn't necessarily, um, that isn't the only thing that you can put on a preprint server. There, um, preprint usually means uh, before peer review, but I actually really dug into this uh, recently. And um, many of the um, uh, publishers that members of the STM Association came out with this joint statement that said, actually, they're okay with not just preprints, but post -peer re the post-peer review version, the, un the unpublished the version, said, uh, right, the but the post-peer review is. version, they're actually okay with sharing in a lot of cases as well, which is a big, a big difference. Another data point for you is that we did a study of this in the physics community, which has had 100% preprint coverage for a long time now, and they haven't given up their journals, and I still have to pay more than almost any other discipline to subscribe to them. <laughs> so you explain to me why that's happening. So, so in physics, so really, so I mean, in physics we have archive, but if there was no archive, um, because it's only a subset of stuff that's an archive, it hasn't made a difference for the journal. Well, I think, so I think, but my, my answer is, I think it, has to be, this is why I said peer review, opening peer review and post-publication peer review is so important. I think it's coupled together with that, right? Um, that will make all of the difference. It's not just, a, we now have a website where we can put a PDF. Right. Um, and I think we're out of time. Sure. <laughs> so, well, thanks everyone for attending. I hope you've all enjoyed the event and found this useful. Please join us outside. We have plenty of food and refreshments for everybody. So, hope to see you out there. Thank you.